SpaceX blow shit up in the name of colonizing Mars. Of course, the United States military wants a piece of the action. Hoo ya. Falcon 9 places 49 Starlink satellites in orbit with style. We've got a Tom Cruise in space update for you. More controlled explosions are coming next week. And we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin and this is SpaceX in the news. On Tuesday, Lab Padre's rover cam 2.0 had a front row seat of GSE-4 being put through the ringer of a liquid nitrogen cryo test to failure. Whether that failure was intentional or not remains a mystery. One thing is for certain, however, the floaters in those porta potties were redesignated as poopsicles. I'm going to pause Lab's coverage here and focus in on the background really quick for our next topic. You can see Booster 4 just had its aero covers installed over the exposed wiring and COPVs at its base, which will protect them from the major flameage of its 39 Raptor engines and make the rocket look a little less draggy. Next to it, its partner in crime, Ship 20, has been hooked up to a crane ready to be moved elsewhere, probably away from Booster 4 for when it flares up. As far as when that will be, your guess is as good as mine, unless your guess is stupid. Ship 420's tower, which will see her off for the first orbital flight, hopefully in the coming months, has been put through some stress tests as well over the past couple of weeks. First, by just simply moving its arms. Then by performing a deadlift without weights attached to the bar. Not because his balls are weak, shriveled, and pathetic, but because he's just warming up. Break some veins! Then once he found his mojo and grew a pair, executed a hernia-free clean pull. <laughs> what? What? Towers like these will be used not only to stack both stages of the rocket on the pad, but also catch them upon return, which could look something like this, but with more fire, dust, and debris, of course. Notice how the arms didn't really move down the structure to time the descent of the booster, which did most of the work. Totally a one-sider pitcher catch relationship if I've ever seen one. In theory, these towers will save some mass by removing the need for landing legs and enable immediate reflight of an otherwise unwieldy giant rocket. Again, the first flight will only come after the FAA's environmental assessment greenlights SpaceX to launch the massive two-stage vehicle. They'll release their decision on February 28th, so they say. So SpaceX is looking at March for liftoff of their first orbital test flight so long as the bureaucrats in DC get out of the damn way. But in prior videos, we also discussed the answers SpaceX's lawyers gave to the FCC in response to their Starship-specific inquiries, specifically regarding the company's plans to launch Starlink satellites to orbit and how SpaceX, quote, intends to begin launching Gen 2 as early as March as well. I told you if that's the case, then we can soon expect to see some action at the Starbase construction yard concerning nose cones and cargo doors. Well, this week, a next generation nose cone has been spotted sitting next to a cargo bay door prototype inside one of the tents. Although it's unclear at the moment what its serial number is. Stay tuned as further information is revealed in coming episodes. Like I've said before, too many things have to go right in order for Starship to launch Starlink in March. I'll just consider it a win if 420, and only 420, lifts off by 420, successfully or not. If the FAA determines a completely new EIS for the area needs to be executed, SpaceX will be forced to launch out at sea or from Kennedy Space Center, Florida, no earlier than this summer. The Cape is currently undergoing its own environmental assessment for the program. SpaceX did just submit plans to construct a really big building at their Roberts Road facility, 320,000 square feet to be specific, with a future expansion of 192,000 square feet. Believe it or not, there are those in the government who want to see programs like Starship succeed like NASA and the US military. The Air Force just awarded SpaceX with a $102 million contract to demonstrate the technology and capability of transporting military cargo and humanitarian aid around the world, the largest one ever awarded for such a thing. According to the agreement, SpaceX will design cargo bays compatible with US Transcom intermodal containers. It includes the opportunity for a full-up demo of transport and landing, something we would all like to see. And NASA announced on January 18th and 19th during their Advisory Council's Human Exploration and Operations Committee that after Starship lands humans on the moon for the Artemis 3 mission, it won't happen again for two more years. Instead, Artemis 4 will dedicate itself to the construction of the lunar space station called Gateway. By then, SpaceX will most likely have already started building their colony on Mars. Moving on to our next segment, Meow. On Tuesday evening, SpaceX launched another flock of 49 Starlink satellites on a reused Falcon 9. What was really special about the stream was the rare infrared ground tracking they provided the viewers of stage step and fairing deployment. Ah! 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 
And as if that wasn't enough, both cameras on the booster's interstage and drone ship did a swell job staying connected for this touchdown. It was the 10th mission for this booster, making it the fleet's fourth to accomplish such prestige. Elon twatted before the mission that they had 1,469 Starlings active back to the moon soon. A recent volcanic eruption left Tonga without a lot of things, including internet, so Elon is looking into the possibility of sending over some Starlink user terminals. This is a hard thing for us to do right now, as we don't have enough satellites with laser links and there are already geosats that serve the region. We do have other launches and landings to look forward to in the near future. The CRS-24 Dragon capsule is expected to undock from the space station Saturday morning to splash down with its cargo under Chutes Bra on Sunday afternoon. NASA also said that the first private astronaut mission through the ISS, Axiom-1, is now targeting March 31st for launch with Crew Dragon. If you remember back to a couple years ago, I reported that Tom Cruise had purchased a seat with Axiom Space to fly to the ISS on Dragon for a movie. But now we finally know why they wouldn't even let him tag along in the overhead compartment. We are creating thousands of jobs! Turns out on Thursday, his producers for the film announced they are working with Axiom to instead attach a studio module, SEE-1, to the first commercial space station. The station's first module will be launched in September of 2024. C-1 will then be sent up and attached that December. <coughs> According to NASA commercial crew manager Steve, Crew-4 is now slated for no earlier than April 15th and will be the first crew to fly on a thrice-flown booster. Next week is action-packed with uncrewed Falcon 9 missions, another Starlink mission is booked for the 29th, and CSG-2, a radar surveillance satellite built by Thales Alinea Space, will launch on January 28th. That's Italian. <laughs> and now it's time for today's Honorable Mention. If you're hoping to live on Mars one day, you might want to read a study just published in Nature Medicine by the Ottawa Hospital and the University of Ottawa. They found that space anemia is a bigger problem than what scientists previously thought. We already knew that floating around in space causes the body to destroy 50 to 55% more of its blood cells than what it would on Earth, and could potentially lead to anemia. A condition that stems from a lack of healthy red blood cells, and it can be life-threatening, and people who are anemic suffer symptoms like fatigue, rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, dizziness, pale skin. Basically, it's me after water aerobics. Great trunks. <laughs> It was always expected space anemia would resolve itself over time since the human body tends to be very adaptive, but after studying the bodily fluids of 14 astronauts before, during, and after a six-month stint to the ISS, it turns out that's not the case. Quote, increased hemolysis by 54% was a primary effect of exposure to space in astronauts that persisted throughout their long-duration missions and may constitute the leading mechanism of space-related anemia. This should be considered in the screening, monitoring, and follow-up of astronauts launching on space exploration missions as well as space tourists. So if you want to be a Martian, be sure to pack your B vitamins. Or just reserve a hypersleep pod, then it won't matter if you're lethargic, because you'll be DEAD! Thank you so much for sharing this positive experience with me. You can also follow me on Locals for more positive and eccentric stuff. Have a nominal weekend, and until next time, Godspeed.